Welcome. Um, I'd like to uh, basically introduce myself very quickly. I've been in the educational field for almost 30 years, 10 years as a college professor and 20 plus years in the training industry, primarily as a well, instructional designer, creative designer, uh, director, um, what else? Instructional designer on all levels. Um, can I go ahead and get to um, the first polling question? Is that, is that me here in the chat? Yeah, but, yeah it's uh, hidden for the moment, so our staff can put that up and figure there it is right there. Look at that. Like magic. Polls, if you click on polls, you should see it. Uh, select the focus of your learning interest is up now. And that's true for the audience, too. If there, there was not a polls uh, tab next to chat, but there is now a polls option now that we have a poll up. So next to chat, you should see polls, and you should be able to answer the question. Select the focus of your learning interest. And we are seeing, uh, we, we encourage you to vote, always, and, and now, uh, but always, especially uh, now. And uh, please go ahead and, and do so. We're seeing the answers coming in. OK. Thank you all. Yeah, that's very interesting because one of the things about the learning continuum that I find intriguing is the disconnect between academic um, and educational learning, uh, acceptance of learning continuum and the corporate world is still kind of scratching its head saying, well, I don't understand this. If we, uh, if we give a person a course, then they should be fine, right? Um, sort of uh, in, a, in a sort of, uh, caustic way, this is often called the spray and uh, pray approach, where if you give somebody an opportunity, then, you know, a year from now, six years from now, they should still be doing it. Um, can I have the second poll question? We're basically in the academic world, you know, there's 100 level, 200 level, 300 level, things of that nature. Waiting for the other polls just to come in here. I see. What is your familiarity with the concept of a learning continuum? That's popped up above and pushed the second one below. And we do see answers coming in. So we have. Yeah. So it seems like a majority of people are relatively new to the concept. Um, hopefully, you'll learn something in the next 20 minutes or so. Now, I have the third polling question. It seems to be taking. This one is taking a minute to post, what I see. It seems to have been cut off. I think we can you do this one? Uh, can you do this one just uh, by, you know, by speaking? It seems to just not be, it seems to be cutting off. So there's a little technical issue. You just ask the question and we'll ask people to, to answer in the chat and do the best we can with that one. Yeah, I mean, we could probably go without it. Um, so let me just go ahead and, and talk a bit more about my presentation. You know, it's very interesting that people sort of forget how we how we uh, mastered skills and learn not a knowledge. For example, um, short of those of us who are just thrown in the pool and told to swim, most of us advance through various swimming lessons from beginners to intermediate. Uh, some, sometimes we have some coaching, things of that nature. The uh, same with a musical instrument. If you think about um, how you learn to play music. Yeah, there's the stories of people who pick up an instrument and immediately can play it, but more typically, and uh, usually it's a parental uh, decision, um, you know, we either pick up an instrument or are told to pick up an instrument. And if we're lucky, we get lessons and potentially play with a group and sort of do the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours uh, until we get to master it. And same with riding a bike. You know, I would think very few people could jump on a bike at age three, five, six, and just start cruising. No, I mean, you know, typically you start with training wheels or you start with an adult helping you to keep uh, balance behind you and things of that nature. So in a rough way, this is what the learning continuum is. It's basically acknowledging that Nobody really uh, can master anything with a one event uh, learning opportunity. So this is sort of how I view the learning continuum and a lot of other people obviously view the learning continuum. And basically, you know, it starts with um, what's needed for effective learning. And 
as I just talked about, and we'll focus a bit more after this slide, you know, most people would say that um, effective learning is dependent on repeated exposure and experiences, okay, that result in embedded memory. And then what's required for embedded learning? Um, this is sort of an instructional design issue in the sense that uh, the learning must be practical, relevant, and delivered with a psychological content. Um, why do I say psychological content? And David, you touched upon this a little bit when you talked about uh, scenarios as an effective way of learning. Um, but basically, if I was to ask any of you, um, um, let's say, where, uh, what phone number did you call at, uh, earlier this morning? Chances are that you probably won't remember. But if I ask you to recall the phone number when you were a young kid in your house, chances are you may remember it. Or for instance, if I, for those of you that listen to music regularly, I might ask you to, to uh, recite the lyrics of a, a current song of yours. And chances are you probably won't be very uh, verbatim in terms of it. But on the other hand, if I ask you to think about a song you learned as a kid or at camp, uh, maybe one that you associate in some way with your youth or adolescence and ask you to do the lyrics, you'll get a lot further in understanding the lyrics. And we'll talk about from a neural, neuroscience point of view, why this is important. So as an instructional designer, I always um, try to inter, inter, uh, integrate some kind of dramatic scenario because we tend to identify with characters. And if we identify with characters, the chances are we'll have some emotional feeling. Um, just as uh, I think Trevor was said, I want to see the outcome of that video with the lawyer. So, um, and then for those of us in organizations, a lot of times, you know, we need leadership to commit to a performance learning continuum because there's a lot of other parts besides just offering learning opportunities. There's there's this commitment, which, which will also require communicating that a com commitment. It will require extra budgets because we're going to have various levels of learning over time. Uh, marketing, I'm a big believer that uh, not enough organizations do the kind of marketing before uh, learning events start in the same way that, you know, if you go to the, when we used to go to the movies, remember that, um, you know, there would be a coming attraction. And so a lot of a lot of uh, commercial co businesses will always do something similar to that. They'll do a marketing campaign, they'll do a launch, they'll do reminders. I mean, we're all used to sort of seeing this stuff in our email. And then, how should learning occur over time? Well, again, you know, training is only one part of learning. Um, it certainly should be spaced over time, and we'll talk about the forgetting curve next. Uh, but it should also be delivered in different ways, and we'll talk about that in a second too. But I think what also happens, particularly in the corporate world, is that people end up relying, let's say, on e-learning or micro-learning or um, self-guided learning, like you know, step action tables, things of that nature. And to me. It's more effective learning if we go about things in different ways and offer offer people different ways of learning because there's different types of learners. And finally, again, I see this because I've also often worked for uh, training companies that 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 have uh, third party uh, courses that they sell. That a lot of these libraries are, you know, an inch deep in a course. They're uh, yeah, they're an inch deep, but they're not wide. They're not a mile wide, and they're a mile wide. Sorry, forgot my little slogan there. In the sense that they often don't go beyond the foundation learning, the overview learning. So um, again, I think when you start thinking about a learning continuum, you do want to have a progression just like you do with a skill that we talked about earlier, whether it's swimming, learning an instrument, where you, you, know, you clearly start at a beginner's level but you get more refined as you move up. And obviously college does this pretty well where you start with a 100 level course and you move your way up to a 400 level course. And then if you wanna continue, you go on to graduate school, things of that nature. 
So one of the reasons the learning continuum is really important is because of what's been around since the uh, um, 1885, the, uh, the uh, Eppinghaus forgetting curve. And uh, think about this. I mean, let's say you're going to the grocery store and you give yourself a verbal list. And maybe there's 12 things on your list. And, you know, all the time that you're dr either driving or walking to the store, you're going through that list of 12. And, you're, you're, you know, you're doing a pretty good job refreshing yourself. What do you want to buy? Well, how many of us have had the experience that when you leave the store, uh, if you're fortunate, by the time you're not too far from the store, you go, oh, I forgot these two things. Or when you get home, you go, I need to go back to the store. You know, I think from a neuroscience point of view, it's pretty clear that most of us can only really retain about five to seven uh, items at one time, whether it's information or knowledge or things like that. And then obviously, over time, we tend to uh, forget that the specificities. And so there's been various studies done um, in terms of how the brain deals with uh, retaining memory and, or fails to retain memory. Um, and again, from a learning continuum point of view, you know, space learning is definitely one of these ways that people are going to learn better. Um, and also, the, uh, as I'm going to talk about in a second here, um, a lot of this is neuroscience. So a lot of us are familiar with blooms, you know, it's been hammered into those of us who work in the <laughs> learning space. Um, some of, but to me, a lot of times there's not a connection with, with Bloom and the brain. Now, obviously, for those of you that aren't familiar with Bloom, it's a, it's a taxonomy of learning where you start with very basic things like identify, um, explain, and then work to more and more high level cognitive thinking like create, analyze, problem solve, things of that nature. But as you can see from the diagram of the brain, each of these uh, knowledge tends to uh, embed itself primarily in one section of the brain rather than all of the brain. So one reason is that any kind of training that or learning that's involved that has an emotional resonance or a psychological resonance is, uh, is going to go in the um, that tiny little part of the brain that sometimes is called the limbic region that basically also sometimes referred to as the reptilian version, which basically means, you know, it's the most primal part of our brain. It's the one that where we have fight and flight and where we sort of respond to things on an emotional level. Um, it's one reason why trauma is, uh, is ongoing and is often very difficult uh, to uh, alleviate in the sense that trauma uh, almost without exception, at least to my way of thinking, has a strong emotional component. Um, you know, we can, if we think about our own trauma, we could come up with how we felt, what we saw, what we heard, what kind of reactions other people did, what we did. And, you know, all that stuff is, is, in, the, is, is in a very small but very powerful part of the brain. The hippocampus tends to do more with memory uh, it may be where we know where we can store things like a family tree or multiplication tables or the list of presidents, things of that nature. And the neocortex is where, to my way of thinking, too much of training and learning takes place, which is really the short-term memory, um, uh, you know, the thinking part of the brain. Uh, but not necessarily the retaining and memory part of the brain. I think the other thing that I touched on earlier is uh, the thought of uh, multiple intelligence. You know, this is based primarily on the work of Harvard professor Howard Gardner. Uh, and he wrote a book in 1983 called Frames of Mind. And he's, he, I think he started with eight different ways of learning, and now he's up to like 12, as this um, slide shows. 
but basically, you know, he came upon the, as a lot of research, researchers do, the sort of obvious point that different people learn different ways. You know, some of us learn reading, some of us learn by watching video, some of us retain things, you know, through our senses, some of the, some things we learn through um, body memory. In other words, you know, if I wanted to be a good basketball player, then I have to have to shoot a lot of hoops. You know, I can read about it, I can hear about it, I can watch great basketball players, but I need to have that muscle memory to, to get better at it. Um, and the arts, of course, things like this. So again, I find too much um, course development and learning plans and things of this nature uh, depend on one or two of these intelligences instead of realizing that different people learn different ways. And therefore, over the continuum, you know, it's good to maybe present or entice learners with slightly different emphasis on which intelligence we're talking about. I'm humming along here. Let's see what's next. Yeah, so, you know, another thing that's become of late, uh, I mean, it's not really of late, it's probably been around for 20, 30 years, but it's experiential learning. Um, I have three daughters and they went to uh, an experiential learning grade school, uh, somewhat, somewhat based on outward bound, which is basically saying that, you know, we can teach you in the classroom, but you're going to learn more uh, and apply more and, re and remember more if we take you out into the world. So I had a seven-year-old daughter who was building a snow cave in the middle of the Colorado winter where we live. Uh, and, you know, or or uh, rafting down the Colorado River as a way to experience nature, as a way to see the kind of plants and animals that one might see, learn about the weather, uh, learn about what happens to the human body under certain different conditions, things of that nature. Um, to this date, I haven't built a snow cave. I'd probably have to ask my daughter if she remembers how to do it. But again, this is this whole thing that is that I think is part of the learning continuum is understanding the fact that, um, you know, and 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 you also will see the notion of this is that and uh, is that is, is that you know it doesn't stop as we get more information as we start thinking things in maybe deeper ways we repeat the cycle. Um, so again, I think when it comes to learning continuum, often what's left out is this kind of experiential learning. Now, I think uh, as our previous video showed that you know, with the with the with the acceptance, more wider acceptance of uh, VR, AR, for instance, or on the job training, which has been around for a long time, you know, this takes care of part of that learning, but there's still things where people have to practice. They have to experiment, hopefully in a safe environment and things of that nature, uh, and they have to try it. Um, you know, one reason uh, we have training is because uh, we want people to be able to, to try uh, new skills, or practice new skills, try them and practice them in a safe environment. Um, you know, like for instance, surgery. You know, <laughs> I would hope that my surgeon spent lots of time working with cadavers, uh, working with simulations, um, all kinds of things like that, rather than uh, you know observing, assisting, rather than just saying, well, you know, I'm going to try out uh, my brain surgery skills today. And another another thing that's happening is is uh, you know there's been a lot of thought um, to the what's called the performance support infrastructure. Um, it's been around for more than 40 years. Uh, but again, to some people, it's rel relatively new. And as you can see, um, if you go along the line, you have the continuum of the infrastructure, which are learning support uh, tools or systems um, th that are ongoing. In other words, we don't, you know, we allow people to learn on their own. We allow people to learn through peers. We have a whole structure in place that's just, that is beyond just the coursework. Um, but basically, you know, that there's a period of training 
And then there's a period of transfer of those skills and knowledge uh, to a, a competency level. And then, of course, the real key is sustaining uh, this over time. So since we have limited time, I'm going to go ahead and just show you an example. So or three examples, rather. So for instance, you know, in the first example, it's kind of like learning continuum light. You know, we would have some we would have some marketing, get people excited about what's going to happen. And then we would obviously give them some foundational level and then some reinforcement, maybe 30 days out, 60 days out, a year out. And not just tell them to take the course over again. You know, I do I do a lot of work in the compliance space. And, it, you know, when you look at the evaluations of some of these learners, they go, why did I have to take the course that I took last year and the year before? So, again, if you're going to, if, 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 you know, there are, there are required compliance courses, but if you changed it up every year or so, I think you'd have much better ROI, you'd have much better performance and retention. Um, and then, you know, level, the second and third example get um, a bit more sophisticated in their learning continuum. But again, hopefully you at least see that there's space learning um, and that there's uh, different ways of presenting uh, and encouraging people to do that. Um, so as I wrap up, up here, um, you know, please take a look at the slide. I'll highlight it very quickly. But you know, each method and each part of the continuum uh, depends on learning, learning processes, multiple methods presented in different contexts, and you know, we try what we can to make sure that not only are people exposed and learn, but they can practice these skills or apply these skills with a level of confidence. And having that level of confidence will allow them to build more specialty over time. So I think I have about five, five, ten minutes left here, David, for questions, if you have any. We have uh, five minutes left now for questions. If you want to put questions in the chat. Um, we can we can cover them, and um, you know in the meantime, in the meantime as we're waiting, um, maybe if you, you could speak a little bit more. We you know we talked we covered a lot of different concepts, and and I agree with you completely. Some of these uh, have been around for a long time and are only now getting uh, more you know, more appreciated, particularly experiential learning and performance support. Um, can you talk a little bit more maybe about where you see performance support fitting in? you know, complementing training and in some cases obviating the need for training entirely as uh, as how I was talking before. So let's talk a little bit about performance support. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it is changing to where there's a lot more emphasis. You know, as I said earlier, a lot of times customers, clients, you know, they'll say, again, if I can use the compliance world as an example, you know, we have to train everybody on harassment. So, you know, take this course in an hour for an hour and next year you're going to take the same course for now. But you know, that's very different than providing people resources. Not only, for example, um, sometimes you can create little 30 second videos that might be a scenario followed by rhetorical questions, get people thinking about it. You know, you can create infographics, you can create um, blog, you can have direct people to blogs, you can direct them to PDFs. So there's a lot of different, what you can do with discussions in a box where sometimes I'll do like, you know, you write a quick leaders facilitator guide for a manager who let's say is in a factory to just run, you know, when they have their morning safety meeting, let's say that they can take five, 10 minutes and keep keep the issue of, of preventing and recognizing uh, harassment in front of people. So I think there's a lot more of that. I think the learning management systems are a lot more sophisticated now in order to support these um, different learning performance aids. Uh, you know, you can you can load them all as separate assets and either assign or or open them up to uh, to learners, things of that. Yeah, nature. no, and I, I think you mentioned compliance training, which you know, I, I, it's great to see better compliance training. One of the challenges I think with compliance training is often the goal of the training for an organization is simply to comply, right? So they all they want, you know, they they aren't really trying to 
address potential behaviors or head them off. They're really simply trying, okay, we have this legal requirement. And so you do something very silly and take a test. And there's even less incentive than sometimes there would otherwise be to do something good. So it's 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 great to hear that you, you've uh, had some opportunities there. Do you have a question from the chat? Yeah, if I may just quickly okay. respond to you there, David. You know, I think they're not, like in my work with compliance companies, we, there's been a big seat change because initially compliance training, to your point, was basically to was to was a was to mitigate liability on the employer side or the organization side. You know, now I think, and and the events of the last couple of weeks uh, should let us realize that a lot of this needs to be aspirational. It needs to say, we want to create a civil and respectful society, workplace, because these are the benefits and these are some of the hurt and harm uh, that it mitigates. So I think there's been a big change in that, though I think there's still a lot of compliance companies that are just turning sure. out the right no, I'm sure. and, and yeah, I mean, it, it's at least nice that things that are the right thing to do for so many reasons are in alignment with the business goals and it really shouldn't have to come to that, but at least it's better than, than the alternative, which we've seen where there hasn't been the interest. Uh, one last question before we um, we wrap up. There's a question from the chat asking if you have uh, studied John Medina. This is someone who you've run across before. You know, it's not familiar to me, but I'm, I, that person can share. Or if yeah, you know, no, it's not the one I know I either. Uh, Elizabeth Barber is, is raising some chat on Elizabeth in the next 30 seconds. If you can get back to your keyboard and want to tell us, tell us more, feel free. And if not, we can certainly pick it up um, later or, or during Elizabeth's own talk uh, later on in, uh, in the program. Uh, so great. So I think it probably just leads us to the time to wrap Okay, he's a neuroscientist on brain cognition, um, relevant to what you're speaking about. So someone to, to look up. So thanks so much for that recommendation and uh, to us and, and to everyone. I'll have to add him to my exactly. slide. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't know if that always has to be the first thing. It's a very, you know, 2020 <laughs> thing to do. Like, here's someone new, I'll put it in my slide deck. Well, hopefully we'll read it, we'll like it, we'll see him speak, and we'll we'll see some value in it and, and integrate it. So thanks for sending that. All right, Larry, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it. Great to have you, you here. Hopefully we'll stick around for the rest of the conference. We'll see you in the chat. Terrific. Right. Thank you thanks very much, again. David.